we have partnered with NC Growth to bring you this series, Navigating the Great Pause. And one of the, th one of the big reasons we did this is during this time of COVID, we found that a lot of business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs had a lot of questions. It was a lot of the same questions. So we put this together to help entrepreneurs and business leaders connect with experts, resources, and each other to really create stabilization and calm during this time and help us all get through it well. So today's um, session I'm really excited about, it is about pivoting. And we have some entrepreneurs, um, different businesses, um, for, for very different businesses, who've all had to make shifts during this time. So these stories can really inspire you and give you some other ideas for what things you can do in your own business. They're also all launch companies. And our moderator today, um, I'm pleased to welcome Velvet Nelson. She's going to be moderating the panel. And um, also a thank you to Keisha Jones, who's our director of community. And you'll see her on the chat and managing the questions and everything else. So keep in mind, if you're moving rooms and your video's on, turn video off. If you have questions, um, definitely open the chat and um, put your questions in there and we'll get those over to the moderator. So without further ado, um, Velvet, take it away. Thanks, Vicki, I appreciate it. Hey everyone, my name is Velvet Nelson. I am the director at Launch Chapel Hill and it's a pleasure to speak with you all today. And if you participated in our showcase last night, I'm sorry you have to hear my voice again but hopefully uh, you got some good information. Um, so just before we get started, I kind of want to give you a quick overview of Launch. So we are a business accelerator located uh, here in downtown Chapel Hill. We're, we're held in partnership between UNC, the town of Chapel Hill, and Orange County. And so we are um, here to provide co-working space and a community for entrepreneurs to um, get the help that they need to grow and scale their businesses. So we have a lot of um, founders who hang out here in the space and use our mentorship and our network um, as they're navigating through uh, building a business. As you can imagine, the past few weeks have been a little bit crazy for us. Um, there's not as many people here, and we have a lot of companies that are to navigate through um, COVID-19. And with that has come several companies who are uh, pivoting or changing um, the way they're doing things in order to respond to this pandemic. Uh, so I've been getting a lot of emails and, and communicating with a lot of entrepreneurs. So when Vicki asked about what I thought would be beneficial to individuals in the Navigating the Great Pause series, I thought this was a great topic of conversation to help inspire other founders who may be looking at ways that they can pivot their businesses and um, just kind of change their track a little bit in order to um, accommodate the needs of those around you. One thing I do do in all of my sessions before I get started is I make everyone smile and take a picture to prove to my mom that I actually do something at my job all day. So I'm gonna do that really quickly. So get your hair fixed and uh, smile real big and I'll take a picture. One, two, uh-oh, hold on. Let me get this going. All right, one, two, three. All right, awesome. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we're gonna introduce our panelists really quickly um, and have them talk a little bit about how they're pivoting their businesses. So we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So Alex Brandwine is up first. Alex, um, welcome to the panel, and um, I'd love to just hear a little bit about you and your background and what your business is and how you chose to pivot to respond to COVID-19. Sure. Thanks so much, Velvet, and thanks so much for having me on the panel. I'm just, I'm flattered to be on it. I've been an audience member basically every other week, and so um, I, I'm just going through it like everybody else here and, and still I'm figuring things out. And, well, I'm, I'm so happy to share my story. I hardly have any or, and all of the answers. Um, so I am a raised New Yorker. I just graduated from UNC's business school a few weeks ago, and I'm the founder of Brandwine's Bagels. Brandwine's Bagels um, is working to provide fresh, authentically made, boiled and baked New York style bagels to the Chapel Hill and Carborough area. Just a few weeks ago, we started construction on our location at 505 West Rosemary Street on the corner of Graham and West Rosemary. 
And so over the last year and a half or so through the launch program, part of the fall 2019 cohort with Amy Velvet and Vicky and, uh, and Emily, who's also another one of the panelists. And through that time and many of the other people that are on this call, I've worked to develop this concept through pop-ups, through events, through tastings, through caterings, and to get to a point to decide to actually go through and open up my business. The timing of COVID was pretty interesting for me. I signed my lease on February 14th. I did my last sort of big pop-up on February 2nd. And at that time, um, after we had that event, I thought, saw what was going on and sort of said, okay, well, this is lucky. Um, this doesn't really necessarily apply to me. I have one employee who's not going anywhere, and I'm just going to put my head down and focus on getting to build out and getting to our permanent location. Um, that sort of changed pretty quickly, and I started thinking, you know, the whole thing about Brand White's Bagels is being part of this community and having a product that, that hopefully provides a little bit of comfort. So we started to get involved donating bagels twice a week to the hospitals and setting up a, a pickup delivery service that we called Saturdays are for bagels. So that was our first pivot, um, trying to basically transitioning from doing nothing to finding a way to get involved. And while it was a great way to get out and provide a service, it was also for me as a new business to reach out to a customer base that I never had access to, which were all the locals in this community and not just the student market. And so it was a great way to meet people, connect with people, and provide bagels. Uh, the next sort of pivot for me was, um, and I'm not sure if, when, if you had this experience as well, but I woke up in the middle of the night, and this is before I started construction, and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I am opening up a small business um, when small businesses are suffering like never before. What am I doing? I'm about to invest all my life savings into this. Um, before I got into the bagel business, I should add, I was uh, working in New York City. Um, I was on, in the investment banking private equity world for eight years. And this was a huge for me. And I was sort of saving up my money, not sure what I was going to do, but I'm uh, excited to, to move forward with the bagel business. And so with the help of many people, many of which are on this call, um, I, re I had to look at my business with fresh eyes. I had to re-underwrite the entire first year um, of my business and what that was going to look like and think about um, employment, think about my variable costs, what I could control, whether it was new labor that I'd be bringing on, maybe a more refined menu, um, understanding what my fixed costs were, using sort of the data from these pickup and delivery service and seeing if I do open up um, and I do go through with this investment, what that will look like for the next three months, six months, who, who, who really knows? And so that was a huge moment for me. And so um, during that time period, um, while I was first terrified, it actually led me to think more creatively about my business. And that's sort of been the big thing for me is understanding what are we about how can we get paid? He who told me um, when I sat down with him that it, people's stomachs aren't changing and people's desire for food isn't changing and bagel can be a great product for that. It's really about how you get the bagels to people. And so that's allowed me to now refocus, um, think about online, think about delivery services, think about creating a web for anyone from students to all the way up to retirees. Anyone in this community can go on there and, and have something that, that's easy, can get it, um, and, and we can deliver to in a location that's convenient. And so that's how I thought about my business, decided to move forward on the renovation, and am preparing to open up um, later this summer. Uh oh, we lost you there, Alex. Can you oh, hear no. us? Okay, we can hear you now. So we, we lost just the last couple seconds of what you were saying. Um, the last couple seconds were, um, we basically really just shifted into an online user base. I mean, that's really going to be the focus of us. 
how do we create a website that's easy for anyone to use and access? And how do we create a delivery service platform that's cashless, that's safe, um, and that's easy for people to get their bagels? And that's really been the focus for us, not getting having a more of a simpler menu and then being able to create systems that deliver bagel um, as best and fast as possible. I'm sorry about the connection issues. Sorry about that, uh, I hit mute. No, that's great, Alex, thank you so much. Um, so our next panelist is Emily Baer with Groga. Hi everyone. So my name's Emily Baer and I'm the founder and CEO of Groga. And I have to say, since I've been home at COVID, our, with COVID and everything that's been happening, my family has been craving bagels. So we're very excited about Brand Wines Bagels and everything that's happening with them. Um, so what Groga does is we train, um, we recruit and train yoga instructors and we place them into job opportunities within their communities by partnering with businesses and organizations and schools to offer all ages yoga programming um, to them. So um, I've been in the yoga and wellness industry for over 10 years um, as an instructor myself. I managed um, a studio. I also was the head of marketing for the nation's largest wellness nonprofit. Um, and as an instructor, I saw a lack of instructor support after a, the yoga training. So a lot of yoga teachers would go through trainings and afterwards not have the mentorship and support and even job placement that um, a lot of teachers really need out in the independent contracting community, right? And then as a studio manager, I really saw barriers that were created by the four walls of the studio. So when I created Groga, I intentionally um, decided not to have a studio space to actually partner with different businesses and organizations to bring our program to the community. So oftentimes we, we serve as the first introduction for yoga and mindfulness um, for all ages. So we, our program is for ages two and up. Um, and we have um, Groga in the Workplace program as well as a Groga Kids program. And so, and also during, you know, my time at the nonprofit, I should note that, you know, I really saw a gap um, in children's and employee wellness programs that focus on that mind-body connection piece, which is so important, especially for kids, um, even as young as two. So um, we started about a year ago and um, April was, right before everything with COVID happened, April was our, um, sl slated to be our, our biggest month. We had seven pilot programs scheduled for, uh, with different enterprise clients, uh, partners in the in the community, we had um, real momentum going with um, small businesses to large, multi-location enterprise companies, and we were really excited. And then everything happened, and we, since we work primarily in the health and wellness sector and education, everything stopped. So um, our initial reaction was, whoa, um, my um, mindset was, okay, how do we take action? How do we respond to a need? People still need yoga. They still need mindfulness. They still need um, activities for children and adults. Um, so I began to activate our team and we began uh, creating digital content um, free and um, at uh, for us and um, to offer value to our customers and to really just become a resource for our communities. Um, and then, you know, as far as my communication with my team, I just wanted to be as transparent as possible, um, as clear as possible, and to at the same time remain hopeful and keep them really engaged. And so um, we have a, a, a group of over 90 instructors um, throughout North and South Carolina and um, we have uh, a team of eight community managers that kind of serve as our head in each of the, our communities that we serve. So, you know, I quickly strategized with them and we came up with some alternative method methods for revenue um, by going from kind of partnering with businesses to, to, to offering content, to offering it on our own. Um, and then since then, you know, so that kind of got us through the initial phases where we just like directly, we just went direct to consumer. How do we be a resource for the people? How do we put as much content as possible out there so we can be a resource? 
And then, you know, once um, people started to realize, okay, this is kind of the way it is for a little bit, um, some of our partners started to um, be able to come up with a game plan to offer virtual content as well. So a lot of our, vir our partners, and forgive me, I am outside, so if you can't hear me, sometimes there's cars driving by. But um, uh, some of our partners started to come back and um, say, hey, we have a need for kids programming, or we have a need for uh, mindfulness programming within the workplace. And so we've been able to really strategize with them um, in, unique to, uh, in ways to offer unique programming that meets the needs of their community. Um, and so, you know, and at the same time, we became as lean as possible. So we focused primarily on content creation and larger partnerships and kind of um, scaling back um, so that we can uh, ride, this, ride this time and come out the other side thriving, so. That's great, Emily. Um, thank you so much. And I already have questions coming in, so please keep them coming. You can send them to myself or Keisha or just put them in the chat box to everyone and, and we will um, track them and, and start asking those here in just a minute. Um, so next up is Franklin with IndyCare. Hey, Franklin, we can't hear you. It looks like you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, I was saying I'm Franklin Roy. I'm the president and co-founder of IndyCare. Uh, I'm a UNC School of Pharmacy graduate from a long time ago. Uh, our company is also a launch company from last spring. And we opened uh, in April. And IndyCare is, it's a retail health model that offers on-demand healthcare solutions from within a local independent community pharmacy. And what IndyCare does, it combines the capabilities of medical providers and pharmacists to deliver urgent care, occupational health, clinical pharmacy services, uh, and in-home patient solutions that really bridge the last mile of community health care. So I mentioned we, we did open initially last April in our first location in Hillsboro. By end of February, early March, we had an end of February, we completed our 11th month of being open and we hit for the first time our break even daily patient volume, which was great. Uh, the feedback from our customers has been phenomenal. They don't like IndyCare, they, they love IndyCare. Uh, and in March, we were very much trajecting further upwards and had secured a verbal agreement from a Charlotte pharmacy owner, the uh, highest revenue grossing pharmacy in the state of North Carolina to open what we believe would be our flagship location uh, at their store. So this is a critical milestone for us in the lead up to our planned capital raise in Q3 of, of this year. Of course, then in mid-March, um, as stay at home orders and things hit, we lost 80% of our daily patient volume pretty much overnight. Um, the final meeting we had with the Charlotte owner got postponed for one week at first and then indefinitely. Uh, and we could not get a hold of PPE for our practice, um, which I had been trying since early February, uh, and therefore we couldn't do any COVID testing. So my mindset in all of that was that really listically soberly looking at this you know we're either going to find a way to thrive as a healthcare business in this uh, or we're going to die you know and so it just became a relentless pursuit of solutions um that said i won't i won't lie you know there's some real moments of serious doubt that occur in there you know you're working 20 hours a day for free basically trying to find these solutions. Um, you know, my spouse who provides most of our income uh, as an independent contractor is now out of work and home with our kids. Uh, you know, the gun employment and PPP loans were not really working or coming through to us. And, you know, on a personal level, I have three 
members of our extended family uh, that have died from COVID-19, another six that have been infected, and uh, my father-in-law is still in the hospital today. So, you know, at some point, the weight of all of that, you kind of ask yourself, you know, well, what are, who am I really doing this for? You know, um, so my own family is, is suffering under the weight of this and we're putting so much effort into helping, you know, our staff and other people's families and, and, and why. <laughs> but the answer to that comes pretty quickly. Uh, and the answer is because you can, you know. Uh, in this situation, most people, unfortunately, are in a position where they're sort of the victims of the pandemic. Uh, and I think in healthcare, you have a unique ability to, to be part of the solution. And so that's just what you choose to do. Uh, so, you know, the first thing that we had to focus on was creating an environment for our medical providers where they could feel safe and comfortable uh, and willing to continue to deliver care. I mean, they have their own concerns, their own families. Um, some of them have their own at-risk medical conditions. So that was the first thing because without them, we can't do anything. Uh, the second thing that we really thought through was how, how can we provide some meaningful resources and solutions for our community? Um, that includes our patients, but also other medical practices that maybe need help in managing some of their challenges and some of their patients because they're not ready or equipped to do it yet. Uh, and then the third thing was about, you know, how do we save the, the company, right? I mean, a failure for us to pivot successfully would probably end us. Um, we were coming off one year of building up the business on our own cash, you know, absorbing the losses uh, and getting to the point we had got to. So, you know, going backwards wasn't really a solution or an option. And when you're a healthcare company, I don't think anyone's going to have sympathy for your uh, failures or inadequacies because of the pandemic. So what we did was, a few things. Uh, first, we established a COVID-19 triage solution. We couldn't test patients because we didn't have PPE, but we could still be part of the solution. So we set up a text-based screening tool that patients could use and get screened and get directed towards where they can get care, um, whether that be telemedicine or acute care. We already had telemedicine, um, and so we started using that for video visits and providing in-home flu testing. In March, there was more flu, a lot more flu than COVID in North Carolina, but you couldn't get tested for COVID without a negative flu test. Many doctor's offices were closed or at least weren't seeing patients in person, so people couldn't get a flu test. So we started delivering those out to people's homes uh, with video instruction on how to perform it themselves. And then based on their result, we could qualify or rule them out for further testing and refer them to the health department to get tested. The next thing we added was actual COVID-19 testing. Uh, we were the first practice, first in the state to offer antibody testing. That really helped us in a lot of ways um, to be able to do some things and to clear some patients to be seen in person who really needed to. Uh, and a lot of work and research went into being able to get access to those tests, making sure that they were quality tests and, uh, and making them available. We then secured a deal with a regional lab uh, company to start doing diagnostic testing. We started that two weeks ago. Uh, and we're still one of the few testing options in our area for COVID-19 diagnostic testing. Right now, we're in the process of getting started with building a drive-through testing structure outside of our building. Uh, where we can collect specimens in a drive-up manner from people. And we think that's going to be critical, not only now, but as we move into the fall, because we're going to have to test every patient almost for flu, strep, COVID, uh, before granting them access into our facility. The other big thing we pivoted toward was looking at employer solutions and how do we get the other businesses in our community back to, to work safely. We're in a unique position because we can offer testing, we can offer telemedicine, we can help them work on clearance protocols if they have someone who develops symptoms or develops an exposure. Uh, we can supply them with some PPE that they need 
And we're also working with a few other partner companies from the Triangle on that offer other tools in the toolbox like sanitizing their workplace uh, and data tools to monitor your employees' symptoms. Um, and so that's really kind of where we're at right now is a lot of COVID testing, a lot of COVID patient management, a lot of working with other businesses on bringing their people back to work. Um, and the thing that we need to continue to figure out is how to get the rest that those other, you know, 80% of our patients that we lost because of fear, you know, a doctor's office is one of the first places that people started avoiding going when all of this started. So how do we kind of create a system, a solution that makes them feel comfortable to, to come back and, and to get care? And that's kind of what we're focusing on now. That's, that's fantastic, Franklin. And um, I appreciate you sharing that about your family and uh, keeping you and your family in our prayers. I'm sure that's tough to navigate. So thank you. Um, and our last panelist is uh, Greg Morey. Hello. Um, hey. Yep, I'm Greg Morey, I'm founder and CEO of City Newsbeat. Uh, we were a launch cohort 11 member. Uh, with Franklin last uh, last spring, um, you know, City Newsbeat is is on a mission to be the largest local news provider on streaming television platforms like Roku and Fire TV, uh, so the cord cutters can stay connected to their communities on their terms. Um, that means we're effectively in the television business, which leans heavily on local news to drive its audience, which we then monetize with ads. We formed last. Uh, we formed first quarter last year, and have spent mm, through February 12th of this year building our apps, our software platform, perfecting delivery and engaging the university to help us with really difficult things like uh, artificial intelligence algorithms and a few other um, uh, product development cycles that we went through last summer. Um, at the onset of the shelter in place order, we were focused on developing local customers to monetize um, Tar Heel Newsbeat and Carolina Newsbeat. Um, they had just started to ramp up with some audience. We'd had some great meetings. Um, but all of that is to say that we had not yet run a payroll uh, to keep costs low. We had no tax history because we were under a year old. Um, and so we were not eligible for PPP relief in any round uh, because of the lack of those records. We applied to Orange County, Verizon, AT&T, Google, and Alice for grant relief to no avail. Uh, so we've been living off of savings and personal investments, um, fronting the cost of the development and the growth of audience product and business. Uh, I think we made a sum total of less than $10,000 in the past year, um, just because we haven't been live. So the week before shelter in place order came down, we were very close um, to closing the Chapel Hill restaurant group for three of their properties and a local financial services firm to come in as sponsors of Tar Heel Newsbeat, Carolina Newsbeat on both Roku and Fire TV. Super excited uh, to have a couple more local brands on the channel to add to our proof of concept. And then everything changed. Um, our entire funnel of local business uh, looking to test this new advertising platform um, went on pause. Uh, it just went away. I remember talking to Velvet the first couple days of April and saying, look, if we don't have an answer for a path forward by April 30th, we're out of business. We, we, we can't even get started um, from everything that we've built. And so uh, you know, it was a bad day. Um, the good news is fortunately bad days end when you shut your eyes. Uh, so the next morning I, 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 I got up and um, before I was completely conscious, I sort of asked myself an important question out loud and that is, am I done? Is this over? And I, uh, you know, it's early in the morning and I'm not a, you know, morning person per se. So uh, I kind of surprised myself. I got really emotional, like kind of pissed off at myself 
that I would dare ask that question. Um, and my answer was emphatically, no, it's not over. Um, there are options. I just, you know, I haven't had enough coffee yet to figure them out. So I got up. Um, and since we're taught to focus only on the things that we can control, there were three things I needed to take into consideration and do it with no, there are times when you can talk yourself into decisions and I call that BS factor. And so these had to be asked without BS factor. And the first thing I did, uh, realizing I did not have the audience to scale and to pivot to other industries that had advertising dollars available, I had to rethink my B2C approach, take the software we had developed and create a B2B approach. And so in a B2B approach, I had to ask who are these sort of recession proof ish customers that could use uh, a platform? You know, what did I have that they needed and who else needed what I was doing? Um, we had worked with PAC TV over at North Carolina State University during the hockey season to run a couple of games and ran the, um, uh, the equivalent of the ACC hockey tournament uh, live within Tar Heel Newsbeat. Um, so I, I reached out to them um, and I said, you know, they'd been talking about a licensing deal. And I said, look, how do we accelerate our discussions to close a licensing deal? Let me license my platform to you. And so the key thing about our platform is that we actually enable ads within Roku and Fire TV apps. It's very easy for me to say that, but it's actually a very difficult thing to accomplish. Um, and uh, as a university, as a uh, sports provider, all they had was their existing content library and they had zero way to monetize that right now, which is a problem. Uh, so, uh, they were very enthusiastic and I'm happy to say that as of Tuesday of this week, um, North Carolina State University has licensed City Newsbeat's distribution platform on Roku and Fire TV. It is signed, it is done. They're actually waiting on my invoice and I couldn't be happier um, to have a little cash in. So uh, that's one way we pivoted. The other way we pivoted was I had um, tried to get broadcasters and newspapers to invest in this concept. I've, I've been in this business for close to 20 years. I've been in OTT for the past five. Uh, I was a part of um, the development of Newsy at Scripps uh, after they acquired it and pulling it onto that platform. So I have some experience with it. Uh, I, I got a lot of doors slammed in my face, so I kind of let go of those industries. Um, however, I did reach back out to one broadcaster and um, I had a surprisingly positive experience um, where they have become very open to uh, investing in city news, but not for our platform, but for our capability to produce news in the top 10 U.S. cities of the country uh, from our location on their platform. So it's a licensing arrangement. Again, more of a B2B play than us developing our own audience. Um, you know, so I guess, you know, to sort of sum up my experience in, you know, in a pivot is I, I asked myself a really hard question out loud. Uh, I was prepared for the answer to be, yes, you're done. Uh, but surprisingly, I, you know, that I don't know if it was fear or what it was, but whatever it was, positive momentum happened that day as a result. And I was able to find other folks who were equally as opportunistic, I guess, and looking for ways to pivot themselves and try and build something out of this. So that's sort of my story. No, that's a great point, Greg. Um, congratulations on the invoice, first of all. If you want me to actually send that out as soon as this is over, I will. <laughs> Um, that's awesome. Um, but no, that's a great point. You know, you are trying to pivot and leaning on other companies who are also trying to find ways to pivot is a great way to find new and inventive ideas um, that could help save both of your businesses. So that's, that's a fantastic point. Um, I'm going to throw a wrench on our panel. We have gotten so many questions that the the prep notes I gave you beforehand are probably going to go out the window. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into group questions. And um, then if we have time to circle back and, and talk about what we, we discussed prior, we will. Um, so the first question, um, question for someone like Alex or anyone on the panel has the ability to answer. Uh, what's it like right now coordinating with suppliers and vendors? And I just want to put a time limit on answers just because we're running out of time and I want to get through all these questions. So 30 seconds to 45 seconds. Sure. Thanks, Velvet. And thanks for the question. Um, it's for our business um, from a food perspective, and we've stopped basically producing, but everyone from Lindley Mills flour just down the road and Graham to, to some of our other providers have still been able and we're really fortunate to have that from a construction perspective. Um, we've also not experienced any major bumps um, and credit to the town of Chapel Hill. They've been very responsive in terms of getting inspections and permits and, and allowing us to, to move forward on that front. Great. Any other panelists want to speak to that? I have to, Velvet, uh, my audio cut out when you were asking the question. Could you repeat it? Yeah. Um, how are you coordinating with suppliers and vendors during this time? Oh, yeah. Um, for us, um, we've had to expand way outside of our traditional <laughs> suppliers and vendors to get the stuff that we need. Uh, just using PPE as an example, or even testing an example, you know, I lived in Asia for 10 years, so I had to actually go back to sort of my network there um, to get these things because the, although we work with huge medical supply companies here, they, you know, as early as February went into this kind of allocation mode where they only allocate certain amounts of these high demand products to a, a given business. And it's based on your historical ordering trends. So as a new startup practice, we didn't have historical ordering trends, so we couldn't get anything from, from them. Um, and, you know, I managed through, various i mean i was talking to people in china people in singapore people in the philippines um you know and through a lot a lot of work on kind of non-traditional supply chain uh we were able to end up getting you know twenty five thousand masks about a thousand you know, antibody tests uh, and a bunch of other stuff i just got a few hundred thermometers in the other day but yeah not essentially nothing came through from our regular supply chain uh, during this. Wow. Um, the next question, um, Emily, can you talk more specifically about how you're generating revenue in your current content delivery model? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, so we've had to get a little bit more creative. Um, so our traditional partnerships have been within the health and wellness and education industries, as I've mentioned before. Um, but we have since um, we have recently pivoted when we start when we pivoted and started offering digital content, it opened up some possibilities for us. Um, for example, we have a partnership with the North Carolina, the North Carolina Museum of Art now, who is interested in. Uh, um, giving opportunities for um, to um, children and adults to be able to experience the art in a different way. And so we are able to kind of create um, some curated content that they could then release. Um, and then we're all we're doing, you know, things like uh, workplace virtual retreats. We're doing, you know, we're just tr trying to get creative with our content and um, with who we kind of um, are looking to because you know studios are closed health clubs are closed schools are closed but at the same time a lot of those places have pivoted to virtual and are, there's still a real need out there um, so you know as the need increases for um, for, for that kind of content, we're able to kind of offer that to them and generate revenue from that by also being a resource and, and trying to be as accessible as possible. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Yes, that's great. Great, thank you. And then this question is for Franklin. How will you differentiate from other Minute Clinic concepts and manage the push to telehealth? 
Yeah, so it's kind of two questions in one. So a minute clinic concept is quite different from us because although they are in a pharmacy, they in no way, shape or form use pharmacists as part of their care delivery model. Uh, we use pharmacists in an integral way, uh, in a way that really transforms the, the operation of, of, of community pharmacy. Um, the other way we're really different from Minute Clinic is just in the, the sort of level of acuity and the range of services we provide. Their, their new model of their health hub model that they've kind of started this year looks a little bit more like what we do compared to the historical model, um, still some differences. Telemedicine is kind of a separate question um, because telemedicine is available everywhere. I mean, it's been available everywhere for some time, although utilization was very low. Um, the decision by all of the payers, Medicare, insurance companies, et cetera, to now pay practices for telemedicine at the same rate they pay them for normal visits has exploded its use right now during the pandemic. But telemedicine by itself is kind of a low value proposition. We, we think that, you know, because you can see someone on a video, they can assess certain things. Maybe they can send a prescription to your pharmacy. Uh, we, we think that telemedicine is a better tool when you can combine it with resources that are local and accessible and even solutions that you deliver into a person's home. Uh, and so that's how we use it, you know, is it's not just here's telemedicine, anybody come and talk to our medical providers. It's, it's more of an integrated part of the services and solutions that we offer in a, in a community. And when you can combine it with in-person, in-home uh, solutions together, it can be much more powerful. Great. Yeah, I think that's um, a brilliant point, um, you know, combining that with uh you know, in-home services and, and I mean, even the flu testing, just, you know, how brilliant was it to, to push that forward so quickly? So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so now I want to go back to um, a general question for the panel. Um, and we can start with Greg, since uh, he was the last one to talk, we'll make him the first one to talk now. So you had your business model before COVID. And then you made the decision to pivot. Um, and it sounds like most of you made that decision to pivot because you needed to find ways to generate new streams of revenue. So well, how do you operate moving forward? Um, it seems like we are in a world now where we have to exist with COVID-19 for a while. And you know, one day there'll be a vaccine and, and we'll see what happens then. But as a company, how, how do you operate moving forward in this new world we're in? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question, right? It's, um, you know, for our business, there's a couple of factors that are unique this year that will come into play as the quarters play out. And the biggest is probably the it's a presidential election year. Um, so there will be quite a bit of political advertising in the market um, available. Um, as we scale audience, I think for us, um, you know, it's, it's been sort of a, a short term, mini term play on pivot, right? We now have customers and partners that, you know, weren't anticipated in any of the original models. So we have to consider them and make sure that we're super serving their interests. Um, the, uh, the, the B2B approach for us gives us that breathing room um, to go forward and continue to build the consumer or the B2C side of our business. Um, but, you know, markets like New York, um, Seattle, San Francisco, where we are, these are, these are large cities, but still rely on local businesses. And a large sector of that is local restaurants. Um, and, and things to do in those markets, uh, and especially here in Chapel Hill. So um, things that we've done is we, we, you know, here in Chapel Hill, we're working with Takeout Central, who has agreed to create a co-op program for restaurants. Um, we have relaxed our payment terms from net 10 um, 
pretty much through the rest of the year, uh, Takeout Central has agreed to pick up 50% of the advertising cost for those participating restaurants. So, <clears throat> pardon me, they're jumping into the fray. So going forward, it's going to be different. I think you have to be a little more lenient on payment terms and you have to find some good partners that together you can do something beneficial um, for your community. Absolutely, and, and I think someone made that point in the chat box as well, is as much as it's about survival for the company, it's about how do you serve others in this pandemic, and, and you guys have definitely proven that. Alex, I know that you, um, you're in the middle of construction, so talk to us a little bit how, how you're planning to operate and move forward with this. Sure, so my sort of philosophy has been is need, I need to really embrace um, the current environment that we're in. Um, and to the construction, that's really been a focus on thinking about our customers and creating, it's really been on the fly, and creating an environment that is as safe and as welcoming as possible. How do we do cashless transactions? How do we, even just yesterday, we changed our refrigerator so that there wouldn't be a door for it. It would just be open so that people could just grab their drinks and go right there. Picking out furniture, that would be something easy that we can clean. Um, creating separation in, in our environment. So all those things are, are right top of mind. Um, honestly, I'm just trying to look at it as, as clearly as possible and think that what was going on in the past is not necessarily what we're going to get back to. And so that's been my mindset is we are in this new world. Um, let's think about creating um, experiences that, that work with that. Fantastic. So the next question I, I really have is around resources. Um, so as a panel, I mean, you guys can choose who answers first and where it goes from here, but um, what resources, whether it be community or mentor or network or podcasts or books, what have you really leaned on in this time to, to help you get through this? Well, um, I was part of the cohort 12 with Alex and um, at launch, and um, that's been a great resource for me during this time. Even though the accelerator program has come to an end, it's still like such a supportive environment. We were doing happy hours, which is just nice to like get to connect with other people and laugh and, you know, just take a 30 minutes even just to kind of not have to you know, be in, be in it so much. <laughs> um, so that was a great resource for me. Um, you know, I have to be honest, like from the, when it first all happened, I was very much like, oh my gosh, I've got to just, just hone in on how I'm going to communicate, lean on my own intuition for a little bit and just, just focus on that and not look for outside advice. But as we've kind of, you know, as the coming weeks have started to, to you know, more and more is coming out about what the future is going to look like. Um, I've definitely started to lean more on some advisors um, for specific things as well as, uh, you know, um, how to clearly communicate my message via my website, how to make sure that I'm, 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 you know, really um, executing on the pain points of, my, of the communi community and then like kind of uh, how do I step outside and say my, you know, our whole mission is how do we support communities and how do we create job opportunities for these instructors? And so um, just being able to strategize and think about that, um, it's been really great to like lean on mentors and my advisors to kind of help me navigate some of those questions. Yeah, our EIR, Scott Albert, has been very instrumental in, in sort of being a, a vetting uh, process for us. It's been, um, you know, as things shift and pivot, you have ideas and you want to, you know, sort of run them by. And, and sometimes they ask very insightful questions about that idea without actually calling the idea, um, you know, crazy. Uh, so I, I think that that community um, for, at least for us, as we thought about um, ways that we can pivot uh, was super helpful, super grounding, if anything, um, uh, for us. I've been so like pleasant, like 
the more people I reach out to, the more helpful things have been. I mean, there are so many people, even just on this call, Vicky, Velvet, Gary, Jonathan Collins, like there have been, everyone is, the more you reach out, they lead to more ideas. And I've definitely found through my entire ex short experience of running this business that the more people you share your problems with and what's going on and, and honestly just be vulnerable about what you're going through ends up opening up more doors. Um, and it's been, it's been really rewarding because it's led to more creativity on my part, um, just in terms of what the next step for the business. Uh, I mean, we've, we've used a lot of resources. Um, launch has been great. I've reached out to Velvet several times about different things we're doing. Um, she connected me with the head of the Chapel Hill Chamber, which ultimately connected me to the lab company that we're using to do diagnostic testing. So we wouldn't be doing diagnostic testing right now if, if uh, that connection hadn't, hadn't happened. Uh, so that's, this is one example uh, of many that I could provide. And, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss not to say that my wife has been a great resource too, because while I'm out here at seven o'clock at night, you know, swabbing 13 people at a business that just had a positive case, you know, she's holding all this weight of everything at home and homeschooling and kids and everything that I wouldn't be able to, to do this without that. So yeah, it's been a lot of help from a lot of places, not least. That's great. Well, I'm going to ask you all one final question to wrap up before we uh, hand it back over to Vicki, and this will be a really easy question. But some of the things I've written down during this uh, webinar are um, think more creatively. Who am I really doing this for? Um, this is just what you choose to do. Be part of the solution um, are just some of the pieces of advice that you all have given to us as, as we hear your stories. But last question in one word. Um, what's the one word that you would tell someone as an entrepreneur that's deciding how to pivot? What do they need? Is that resilience? Is it patience? What's that one word? And then we'll hand it back over to Vicki. Any order? Any order. Why? Got to start with the why. I think that's great. Anyone else? Or do we want to leave it there? I'll speak up. Uh, or go, Franklin. <laughs> no, I, was, I think Greg, Greg stole a really good one. Um, relentless is, is something else that I always... Uh, comes out when I think about what it really takes to, to make something particularly as complicated as what we're doing uh, possible. I was going to use the word transparent, mm. um, being honest with myself, with my employees, um, and just look trying to look at the situation as, as clearly as, and objectively as I can. And my word would be listen, um, listen to your own intuition, listen to your community, listen to, um, you know, your higher power, your universe, and I'll let that, um, you know, that, that really direct, listen to your mentors, be open and, um, and trust, but listen. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you all so much. I know you're busy right now, uh, concentrating on growing your businesses. I was there once, it's stressful, and even taking an hour sometimes can, can be a little bit time consuming. So we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us and repping Launch Chapel Hill. Um, if anyone has any interest in Launch and what we're doing, please take a minute to visit our website, launchchapelhill.com. Contact me, I'd be happy to have a Zoom call with you. You can also donate to us on our website and sign up for our newsletter if you want to get involved. We'd love to have you. Otherwise, I am going to hand it right back on over to Vicki, who can talk a little bit about our next session next week and our uh, post-event survey.
Thanks, Velvet. And thank y'all all for being here on the panel. Um, it's been great to see. I saw um, all of these entrepreneurs when they were first starting out in launch and to see how far y'all have all come, especially through the challenges of the past few months um, is really amazing. So um, I'm just so I'm very proud of y'all and just very excited for where you are headed. Um, I think all of your stories demonstrate that you don't do this alone. I mean, that was a consist. There were a lot of consistent themes, and I think the fact that you we have this community together, but also the fact that it's a community that's networked out as well, and the vulnerability. I think that y'all displayed just on the call and the panel today were great examples of what other entrepreneurs and business leaders need to be doing through this time. So thank you so much for being inspirational and just great role models for us. I appreciate it. Um, next week, we're actually gonna have some smaller group sessions, which we got a lot more questions this week, was, which was great to see. And um, I'm excited. So next week, is we're gonna have a lot of our mentors back. We're actually also going to have mentors from all of the local universities. We have Henry McCoy from NCCU. We have Lewis Sheets from NC State. We have Amy Linane with guest appearance from Duke. Um, and some folks, of course, from UNC, and then some of the folks that have been on previous panels are going to be back. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a general session. Gary Trainer, who's done some of our moderating, he's one of our board of advisors, um, he's gonna be moderating, and we're gonna have everyone come together for a group session, and then we're gonna go off into small groups where we can have some more intimate conversations and then come back as a group and discuss what happened. So I'm really excited. We're experimenting with somewhat something new here. Um, so I hope y'all will be uh, here ready to help us beta test this process and see if it's useful and give us some feedback. So please sign up for next week's session. Keisha put it in the, in the note. Um, also, we've been doing these weekly between April and May. We're gonna move to two times a month in June. And um, I've gotten some good feedback on the pre-event survey about other things that y'all would like to see. The post-event survey is also a great way for y'all to give us that feedback, but let us know some things that would be useful for y'all. We're doing this for y'all, we're not doing this for us. And so by getting through this together, but we have to get that feedback from y'all. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks for being here. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Y'all have a great rest of the week. Bye. <laughs>